Well, I usually run from situations of being up front, but I must confess two things to you this morning. First, I have feared man for way too long. And when I realized that it was keeping me from serving the Lord by serving my husband, I told him that I would without hesitation say yes to anything that he thought would be beneficial for us to do together in ministry. So here we are. (laughs) And second, um, as I started preparing for the teaching a couple months ago, I started just thinking and praying for many of your faces. And I am so very thankful because I truly feel that I have the best family that a gal can ask for. So thank you for this. And God's word is so good. So I'm so excited to jump in this morning with you. Well, two months ago, a woman found me at the lobby and she said, hi, I wanted to introduce myself. I've been coming to Mission Bible for a couple months and I actually am so thankful because I'm radically being transformed from all these feminist views that I've had my whole life. And she began to explain that she was actually told not to come to Mission Bible Church because she had heard that women were forced to stay home. They were not allowed on stage. They were not given prominent roles in the body. And she began to explain how thankful she was now that she was at Mission Bible and that she didn't listen to that advice. And she just said, you know, how hard it was to have lived a worldly way for so long and then want to change overnight to a woman of God, one who's reverent and not a gossip or addicted, but one who loves her husband and loves her children and is sensible and pure and a work at home so that to be submissive to her husband so that the word of God would not be maligned. And I saw this weight on her shoulders and in her eyes. Haven't we all felt that weight before? Truly. I know for myself, I lived with a deep-seated internal sin that led to isolation for many, many years, uh, for decades, and it was vanity. The world calls it perfectionism, and it drastically uh, changed my life to the point where, you know, as a little girl, although the seeds were deep in my heart um, before this point of sin, um, as a little girl, I had just this little taste of modeling and there is this book that friends and family would look at and that's the first time i recall having my worth my identity tied to my appearance and when i began to go to high school it only intensified uh to the point where i'm embarrassed to share this (laughs) but i would literally paint my nails every night to match my outfit the next day um I would cancel plans if I had a breakout. You would think as I got married, it would get better, uh, but it didn't. I continued to cancel plans if I did not feel adequately presentable. And I would hide purchases from my husband of clothing. Um, And then when kiddos came, we all know that this body is not getting better. So I would go to the mirror and I would see all my perceived flaws. And um, it, It just continued this cycle inside my own heart to the point where I was isolated from my friends, from my family, uh, from peace, from hope, most importantly, from God and his word. And I would love to say that from the time I got saved after Peyton Faith was born, that it's all gone. But unfortunately, but fortunately, um, as I continued to be sanctified, it's still something that I am praying through to the point where even a dear sister, she came to the house a couple months ago and I didn't know she was coming to drop off a gift and I was knee deep, you know, in shower scum and the messy bun and the big pimple on my forehead and the whole bit. And I literally, when I found out she was at the door, hid like a girl, like literally hid like a girl. And so the Lord is continuing to sanctify me. The kids saw my horrible example. I had to apologize to them and then call my dear sister and tell her, also um, that I was sorry. But maybe you're feeling that today, not necessarily vanity, Um, but you open your Bible or you attend church and you see what God requires of you, yet you feel the nagging of sin and history tell you what you'll never be. Our depraved mind has us look at the person to the left or to the right of us and feel defeated before we've even started trying. 
we may have a situation that we've asked God to take away, maybe even for years, and yet it's still there. And so we find our faith being tossed to and fro. So this morning, I'd like to tell you what I told my friend in the lobby, an answer that I've seen women in the world rejoice in, and an answer that I've come to hold as ultimate comfort under trial. Yet, it is an answer that's often overlooked and sometimes even despised as just an easy answer to give others. So I wanna place it before you as the only answer, the best answer for us to be the women of God that he's called us to be. This morning, we'll look at that answer from one of my favorite passages in the Bible, the book of James. Turn with me to James 5, and we'll be hovering over verses 13 through 18, looking at four different groups, the praying Christian, the praying elders, the praying church, and the praying prophet. The praying Christian will simply show us how and when we are to pray individually. The praying elders will show us who to go for for prayer when we are weary. And the praying church will show us how to pray for one another in community. And the praying prophet will give us a beautiful picture of the power of prayer. So while you turn, allow me to set the scene. Jesus, who is James' oldest half, Jesus's oldest half brother, wrote this letter to the Jewish believers who were dispersed, likely due to the persecution under Herod Agrippa. And James' main goal for this letter was to remind them of the uncompromising obedience they were to have if they had true saving faith. So he goes on to outline a series of 13 tests by which the genuineness of a person's faith may be measured. First was perseverance in suffering. We can recount James' infamous words when he says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let that endurance have its perfect work so that you will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the second test is blame and temptation. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. The third test is response to the word. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For so long, I looked at those verses, just a general rule of life, and all those principles are true. I believe in this pericope or passage of scripture, he's referring to the word of God. We're to be slow to speak back to the word of God, quick to hear the word of God, quick not to be angered by the word of God, which changes the way that we can go into a Sunday morning or any time that we're underneath the authority of the word. The fourth test is impartial love. We can remember that during this time, the church was treating the rich better than the poor. And James says, do not show favoritism, do not show impartiality. The fifth test is righteous works. Faith without works is dead being by itself. Not that, faith, not that our works save us, but it's an indication of our faith. The sixth test is the tongue. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, James says. The seventh test is humble wisdom, that the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle and reasonable, full of good fruits and merciful, unwavering without hypocrisy and sown in peace. And the seventh test, eighth test, excuse me, is world indulgence. He says, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? The ninth test is dependence. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is of evil. The 10th test is patient endurance. Anyone with kiddos in the room? Can I get an amen? <laughs> yes, you too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. The 11th test is truthfulness. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then lastly, prayerfulness and true faith are our last test. And this morning, we're gonna be jumping into prayerfulness. And I believe James left this towards the end because none of these other spiritual practices are possible without prayer. So look at these verses with me. James says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. 
the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's dive into our first point this morning, the praying Christian, the praying Christian. And let's look one more time at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Circle two words with me, suffering and cheerful. These two words remind us, sisters, that as Christians, whether sorrow or joy falls upon us, our hearts must be facing upwards. Suffering translated in the Greek means to undergo hardship or to be afflicted or to suffer trouble. And we have to remember that the Jews at this time, they were scattered. So probably somewhere in the Mediterranean, away from friends, away from family, away from any type of normalcy. And what does James tell them? He says, pray. Most commentators think that James had the prophets in mind. And we'll see in just a little bit, he talks about Elijah. But he may have also been pointing back to prophets like Jeremiah, who faced immense opposition. Or maybe Hosea's marital breakdown, or possibly even Jonah's cry when he says, I remember the Lord and I prayed to him and he delivered me. Sisters, affliction should prompt us to cry out to God. Troubles we know can lead to rebellion or to abandon our spiritual practices. However, we must be mindful of this and instead pray. It gives us an opportunity, however poorly we may succeed, to copy our Lord Jesus at Gethsemane when he says, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Some of you are lonely and you feel abandoned by friends that you've had. Pray. Some of you are being mistreated for your faith at work. Pray. Some of you have an unsaved husband and you find that you're, being, you're drifting farther and farther apart. Pray. Some of you mamas, exhausted and seeing your anger explode again at 2 a.m. when the baby wakes. Pray. Some of you who do not have a husband and you're wondering, when will it be my turn? Pray. Some of you with prodigal children who are far from God and your heart cries out in the middle of the night asking for their salvation, continue to pray. Now you might be thinking, Bree, I'm good. Life is good. That is wonderful. That is why we also circled the word cheerful. That means to be merry or to be happy. And it describes the well-being of a soul or strength of mind. Other translations may say, sing psalms. Praising God is still a form of prayer. It's the thanking prayer. But here's where we must, 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 must stay vigilant. Because it's usually in the good times rather than the hard times where we stray from God. Our good times can lead to things such as complacency or laziness, or maybe even a false assumption that we're able to cope with life on our own without God. But instead, we are to praise him. We are to say, your will is good, Lord, and in you I rejoice. So get this, my husband, he fed our dog Pepper steak for the first time. And she's never been the same since. Before, we used to tell her to go to bed and she would go sit in her little brown bed and sometimes an hour, hour and a half until we were done with family worship and dinner and she would come and be ready. But now we tell her to go to bed and she within seconds is at our feet and it's like she's scouring the floor, especially by our youngest child looking for her serving of dinner. And it's interesting because Martin Luther, he said the same thing. He said that his dog would sit by him every night at the dinner table. His mouth would be open and his beady eyes would always be on his master. Sisters, our eyes must always stay on our master in all seasons of life, in suffering, in joy, good times, and bad, we must acknowledge his sovereign power. Whether it's as the source of supply and need 
or as a source of gladness and our joy. He is our sufficiency and our eyes must stay locked on him. As we wake, we may ask, what would please you, Lord? To rise and let our home be a welcoming place for the rest of our family. So when that alarm clock goes off, we pray and ask the Lord to help us just put one foot on that cold floor when our head wants to be glued to our pillow. And then we may, you know, light a candle or turn on some instrumental hymns, but we run to our words, sisters, not to our phones. And we ask that he would feed our hungry soul after we praise him for answered prayer. As we go into another day of caring for our home, we may feel that temptation to put that load of laundry off or to just do half of the day of school with the kiddos or possibly even shrug our, sense, our, our responsibilities because no one really sees the work that we do all day. But instead, we get on our knees by our bed and we tell the Lord, declaring that he sees us and asking that he would help us to put off laziness and to put on service for our family once again after we get to praise him for answered prayer. As we make another meal, being tempted, just throw a little thing together last minute. We may think that, oh no, the kids are gonna complain that it's tacos again, or that it doesn't look like an Instagram worthy meal. So we pray and we ask the Lord to help us to put off fear of man, to put on a fear of the Lord and a joy to serve our families. And after we get to praise him for answered prayer, as we get ready for bed, exhausted, feeling mentally and physically fatigued, we may be tempted to escape through social media or possibly shove off our responsibilities to our husband or maybe even neglect our own children. So instead we go to the bathroom because we know when we have littles, the only place that we can hear our thoughts is in the bathroom sometimes. And we pray and ask him to help us to put off selfishness, to put on selflessness, to finish the day well. And after we praise him for answered prayer. So whether it's the mundane tasks of the day, when our flesh is crying out like Paul, why do I do the things I know not to do? Or whether it's like the external trials that the Jews were facing here, our answer is to pray. Because when we are weak, he is what, sisters? He is strong, amen. Which is why he then explains where we are to go to find that strength. Okay, so we've got point number one, the praying Christian. Now we're going to look at our second group, the praying elders. Verses 14 through 15 reads, Is anyone among you sick? Then you must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. So we're going to circle two more words. We're going to circle the word sick, not only in verse 14, but also in verse 15, because the Greek words are very important here. Strong's Concordance says about the word sick in verse 14, that this word means to be weak or to be feeble. So it suggests that James is moving from the one who is suffering and cheerful in verse 13. And now we get this picture of the wounded soldier on the battlefield who's weak and who's feeble. It's helpful to slow down here and understand the word study. Because if we look at the 33 different passages in the Bible that this Greek word is used for sick, we see that sometimes it does refer to physical sickness, but more often it's actually translated as weakness spiritually or weakness in personality or weakness that comes from the difficulties of life. So with that in mind, let's read that first. Is anyone among you weak? Let him call for the elders of the church. This can change the way that we view pastoral prayer. Because if that translation's correct, when we're down on the battlefield, not just by severe sickness, but emotionally and spiritually feeling like we cannot keep going. Our tendency is to run from church in those times, is it not? God wants us at church, going to our pastors, going to our sh- those who provide shelter for us for prayer. First Timothy 3 tells us they are above reproach, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not fond of sordid gain, 
but managers of the household. Ladies, these are spiritually strong men. Think about how this can change our Sunday. If you're feeling weak and you're feeling feeble, receive prayer from your elders. If you're married, ask your husband to join you. I love, love, love that our pastors and elders are here every Sunday after every service waiting to pray for those in need. The world tells us to fill our weakness or our hurt with TV, ice cream, drugs, alcohol, self-help books, psychology. But what does James say? He says, go to your elders. God's answer is the pastors of a biblical church, and it will always be the true church who has the answer because that is God's grace of giving us his bride in a dark world. Sisters, don't let pride stop you. Be obedient. For those thinking, what's up with the oil? I know I thought that. Um, that word anoint in Greek, it means rubbing. So it's not dabbing on the head like we often hear today. But it's oil meant for washing or for the ancients massaging. Pastor MacArthur, he explains this word was never used for anointing with ceremonial oil. But it was a word literally meant to pour oil on a wound and rub sore muscles of weary believers who had been mistreated. Oil also was applied for external wounds or given when people were dried out from the sun. It can help their parched skin. Susan Heck, I love this quote. She says, James is not saying we should require elders to carry a bottle of oil to ceremonially anoint the sick, but that we should exhaust all resources medicinally. I'll just say it's medicine. If a person's weak and feeble, the elders can pray, but they can still use medicine, exercise, and other common grace options for well-being. Now, some of you might also be thinking, does this mean everybody gets healed? Because that is talked about in some circles today. But let's continue to geek out for just a little bit longer in our word study. Because this little word in verse 15 is actually different than the one that we saw in verse 14. This little Greek word means to be weary. If we look at this closely, it's only used two times in the Bible. Once here, and once also in Hebrews 12, 3, where it says, so that we would not grow weary and lose heart. So it doesn't use the word sick, but weary. So what does this mean? If we look at verse 15, and we use our Greek definition, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is weary, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. It can change the way that we view this passage. I trust that you see the vital importance here. This isn't a prosperity promise. It's not a name it or claim it, but it's saying that the elders are to take the weary person to the Lord, washing them in the word via prayer, and that, that is what will rebuild their outlook. That is what will make them whole. So whether we're weak or we're weary, we must seek out prayer from our pastors, which is why he then expands to the church. So let's review. We've got the praying Christian, we've got the praying elders, and now our third group, the praying church. Verse 16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Friends, sin wants to isolate you. It wants to cut you off. It wants you to feel that no one else is dealing with what you are dealing with at the moment. But God says, let it out. Be honest. Share your struggle. And as women of the word, we all know that everyone is a battle. That should not surprise us. So don't be nervous to let others in. Let them carry your burdens with you. John Stott, he offers us three areas of confession. And each of these are important, but it's really the first two that we deal with on a daily basis. Number one is personal confession. Personal confession, that's just where we are to confess our secret sins to God. And Psalm 90 verse 8, it says, You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. May I encourage you 
Do not put this off. The moment that you see that your thoughts are going wayward, immediately take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Number two, there's private confession. This is where we confess our sin to the person we've offended. Matthew 5, 23 through 24 says, If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your offering. Lastly, is public confession. This is when sins are committed against a group and then confessed to a group. 1 Timothy 5, 19 through 20 says, do not receive an accusation against an elder, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. Okay, I've got a question for you, sisters. Have you ever been to a doctor's appointment and had it get canceled after you've arrived? I'll never forget. I took my daughter to the pediatrician a few months after we had scheduled it. I was looking forward to it. Thought we were there a few minutes early and she, I, I signed in her name and the nurse, the little bit of snarky says, your appointment's been canceled. You were supposed to be here 30 minutes ago. And I, you know, took out my phone and I'm like, what? You know, she has to be wrong. And I have to admit, I did not respond Christ-like sisters. This poor nurse got a little taste of my Italian temper and I walk out with Peyton Faith. I get only two stop signs down in our car on Culver, and I realize that growing knot inside of my stomach is just getting stronger and stronger because I had sinned against her and I had responded in anger. And I knew what I had to do. I dropped off Peyton. I make a you back to the pediatrician. I do the walk of shame back into the, the office. The poor nurse looks up and she's probably thinking, what is this crazy woman doing back here? She's probably pushing the button for security to come. But in all seriousness, she, I just had to apologize and tell her, I'm so sorry. You did not deserve the way that I responded to you and asked for her forgiveness. But it's interesting because Bonhoeffer, he also writes on confession and he says, sin demands to have a man or a woman alone. It withdraws them from the community. Confession in the presence of a brother or sister is the profoundest kind of humiliation. It hurts, it cuts down, and it is a dreadful blow to pride. To stand there before another as a sinner is a disgrace that is almost unbearable. But in the confession of concrete sins, the old nature does a painful, shameful death before the eyes of another. So I must ask you, dear sisters, who is it that you must confess your sin to? Today, not tomorrow be it a husband or a friend, sister in Christ, possibly even a child, for the sake of Christian fellowship. Our proper witness must be dearer to us than the humbling of our pride. Which is why James then finishes with the prayer picture in verses 17 through 18. So let's reflect. We saw the praying Christian and when we are to pray individually. We saw the praying elders and who we are to pray with when we are weary. We saw the praying Christian and how we are to pray for one another in a community. And now we will look at the praying prophet. Verses 17 through 18 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Do you remember this prayer? Shortly before Elijah, he's on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, and he challenges them. If your gods are real, pray to them. Have them ignite your sacrifice. So they start praying and yelling and, you know, screaming and cutting themselves, and it's this whole bloody mess. And what happens? Absolutely nothing. And then Elijah prays to the God of Israel, and God sends fire down from heaven. And it's this epic historical account of God's power. Well, it's right after this that Elijah prays because there had been a three and a half year drought. And he prays and God sends rain from heaven and it showcases to all 
the power and the magnificence of our Lord. So let's understand, why did James put this, this picture of Elijah right at the end of this passage of prayer? It said, Elijah, he had a nature like you and me. 1 Kings 17 through 19 gives us a picture of this when it says that Elijah would rise to the heights of faith and then fall to the depths of despair and depression only a few verses later. Other times he's standing brave and resolute, but then suddenly fleeing from danger. Still other times he'd be selfless towards others, but then others be filled with self-pity. Does it sound familiar? Show of hands, anyone been to the heights of faith and then to the depths of despair? (laughs) Yeah, James is saying that even though Elijah was very ordinary, he was also very prayerful. Even when messing up, he still sought answers from God. And that's what you and I are to do. Even when we've had a bad day, even when we've made mistakes, even when we've possibly mired our witness, God still wants us on our knees at his throne, crying out for more grace. So in closing, I have two questions for you this morning. If you're praying, are you praying earnestly? Are you praying in your prayers? Are you being intentional with your prayers? Just the same way that you would be intentional with those you love in your life. Or are you leaving it to when you feel like it or when you need something? Are you confident in your prayers? Not in the words that you're saying, but in the one that you're saying them to. Are you praying earnestly? Here's my second question. And please, sisters, think deeply with me on this. Why does all this matter? Why pray? Why Elijah? Why are elders? We hear pray, 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 pray. But why? Did you catch it? James said, Elijah, he had a nature like ours. Sisters, even the great prophet was powerless without God. When we are weak, he is strong. When we are downtrodden, he is mighty. When we are hurting, He is our comforter. Without grace, none of this is possible. Prayer is the answer to our longing, to our need, to our humanity. Well, I'm with my sister in the lobby, and I see the tears well up behind her eyes. I see the desire to write her life, to want to make things right with her husband and her children. And I only had one answer for her. Can anyone guess what it was? Prayer. Intentional prayer. Rejoicing prayer. Requesting prayer. Healing prayer. The answer for her is the answer for all of us.